you know, the reason they, they like reading my stuff is that I've always got real life examples to prove what I'm saying. There's a lot of good people that listen to this podcast. You know, other than God and my family, deer hunting would be next in line on my list of priorities. From the bottom of our hearts, it's it's just fantastic and awesome to uh, to have the support that you guys are getting. People ask me about expandable broadheads and love swings. <laughs> Chasing Giants with Don Higgins and Terry Peer. Brought to you by Osseo Camo, nature's most lethal camouflage. Follow along as Don and Terry discuss the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Welcome, everyone, to the Chasing Giants podcast with Don Higgins. I'm Terry Peer, brought to you by Osseo Gear episode what is this don 165 and going to air on april what 16th i believe i think you're right yep we're actually recording on friday morning i would be embarrassed if i turned the camera around in my room here because i have suitcases and suits and clothes everywhere as soon as we get done i head to the airport and heading off to japan so we're recording a little bit earlier so i don't have to do it in a hotel room yeah, everybody's waiting for you to come back and say Chasing Giants in Japanese. I'm going to take Chasing Giants hats with me, and everywhere I see a little Japanese kid, I'm going to, I'm going to make them put it on and take a picture and say Chasing Giants in, in Japanese or something. That'll be neat. you got to start a social media campaign while you're over there every day. Send a picture back from Japan with a Chasing Giants hat on somebody. All right. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> So uh, we got we got a good bit to talk about. We got five good questions. We're going to try to get to all of them today. There's a couple of them that's a little long, but the story I want to talk about is the weather. And let's spend a little bit of time on that to kick it off. And then we have some real world announcements after our friends from Osseo play their commercial. But I spent all week in the evenings this week getting ground ready, and I'm going to be able to plant corn as soon as I come back. But I know up in your area and many parts of the Midwest, this is the first year we have not had a really wet spring and crops are going in the ground. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, maybe even tee it up a little bit further. It's if, if a hunter or land manager is working on their plan for this coming year um, and crops are going in a month early, what are some tips, ideas or things that we can watch for when fall comes around? Well, without a doubt, Terry, I mean, the corn around my house has just been going in like crazy the last couple of days. And we got today and tomorrow uh, with good weather for planting as well. And then a, a small rain, probably a half inch or less Saturday night, Sunday morning, and then an under week of good weather. So uh, there's going to be a lot of corn going to ground. And it's a lot different, as you mentioned, than recent years where April has been very wet and most of the corn around me has been planted about a month later than it is this year, like in May. And I remember one year, even a lot of it got planted in June. Um, so what that's going to mean is an earlier harvest. Um, by September 1st, there's going to be guys in the field, you know, shelling corn. So uh, it, what that means to the food plotter is when hunting season rolls around in most areas around October 1st, uh, a lot of ag fields are going to be harvested and it's a real opportunity if a farmer is going to harvest his crop September, you know, in early September, there's an opportunity to get out there and, and overseed if, if he'll let you, if you're just on a permission property or if you own a property and have some ag ground, you know, those soybeans are going to be turning a lot earlier than they typically would. So you can go out there and, and the corn as well. You can go out there with one of those uh, air seeders some extreme blower cedars and you can see you know plot topper or or a harvest salad or something like that in those crops right before they get harvested and there's going to be enough sunlight um, hit the ground because those plants aren't going to be full and green when we need to be planting those fall crops instead the, they're going to be dried down and sunlight's going to hit the ground and you could go in and, and you could do that seeding ahead of the farmer harvesting <clears throat> and still get a good crop so an opportunity one, coming up that we haven't seen in a few years. One of the things that we struggle with, um, so there, we let's talk two separate things. There's corn and there's soybeans. When we have a later harvest with soybeans and the field doesn't dry down just quite as quick, 
if we try to overseed and that canopy is still there and doesn't let that sunlight get to the bottom, we're basically just wasting seed. But um, if that if that beans field starts drying down a little bit earlier and letting sunlight down through, we can start getting that undergrowth even before harvest, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, I, I see it with food plotters all the time. We get questions, you know, I overseeded into my soybean plot and nothing grew using plot topper or whatever. Well, the reason nothing grew is because uh, the the crop was still green and it canopied over and everything. So, um, so what happens year, is, yeah, what happens is that that canopy still holds humidity underneath of it like a greenhouse. So the seed cell, the shell on the seed actually cracks and swells, but then no sunlight is there to let it finish and the seed just dies because it's actually germinated. It's just there's no seed or there's no sunlight, excuse me. Right. And, uh, you know, that the sunlight is critical for that seed to germinate. Um, even though you wouldn't think so because the seed is typically planted underground, but, uh, that heat of the ground uh, that the sun provides on top of the surface, it, it tells that seed which direction to grow. You know, you could throw a seed in the ground, any which direction, and it knows, which ways up based on the sun, the, the, the warmth of the surface. Um, so, you know, having that canopy, having the ground shaded and no sunlight hitting the ground is really going to affect um, the growth on a, a fall seeded plot, an overseeded plot, and you're not going to get the growth that you would this on a fall like this where the, the soybeans are dried down. Well, let me let me uh, ask you a couple of questions to explain a little bit about beans and corn to the listeners that might not know this. We have a lot of new listeners here lately, so people might not know this. So corn is measured in the days of harvest, meaning like our NutriCrave corn is a 109 day corn, but soybeans are, are labeled in a group number and it's two completely different methods of measuring the maturity rate of the product. So can you go through each of those, the corn measurement and the soybean, and then we can apply that to an early plant date. Yeah. So the corn is, is, is listed in days. Um, different varieties will have different maturity days. Um, I mean, there's 85 day corn, for example, and there's 120 day corn and, and everything in between, like you mentioned, uh, our, real world uh, NutriCrave corn is 108, 109 day corn. Um, that means it's going to take 108, 109 days for it to, to mature from the time you plant it until that, that crop is mature with soybeans are group numbers and the lower the group number, I mean, there's actually group zero soybeans or, you know, 0 0.2 or whatever. Um, that, that is a short, season being the, the higher the number the longer the growing season but at the same time soybeans are also affected by the amount of daylight if you go by a soybean field where there's like a security light or a pole light next to the edge of that field what you'll notice in the fall when that those beans start to turn those beans under that security light will stay green and i've seen that at various places like a, around uh big parking lots where, where they've got lights along the edge that right next right under each of those lights uh, along the edge of the soybean field those soybeans will be green and the farmer a lot of times will harvest the entire rest of the field but he leaves these little patches of of beans under these lights for later because it just takes longer so so daylight has some effect as well but uh you know the combination of planting date and daylight is going to tell that soybean plant when to mature you know, so if we're talking about Real World's Gen 2 beans, that has a variety, of, uh, a blend of four different group numbers. But when we're talking about your local farmer or your permission property, farmers are not planting blends of soybeans. They're planting one group number that's going to produce as many pods and, and uh, as possible and dry down as quick as possible so that they don't shatter with freezing weather as winter comes so the farmer wants to grow as many pods as possible have it dry down and get them out of the field before he loses grain onto the ground right yeah and with our blend you know the the blend is there for multiple reasons first of all you're going to have some 
plants drying down while others are still green. Well, that green is the ones that are green continue to provide browse forage for the deer. Uh, the other thing is we're hedging our bets when it comes to shatter. Um, different um, climate conditions can cause soybeans to shatter and different varieties to shatter, you know, different or or totally resist shatter where, where one might shatter under certain conditions. So by having multiple soybeans in the blend, we're hedging our bets on shatter. And uh, if, in other words, if one of those soybeans does happen to shatter because of the certain weather conditions, you still got the other two or three, depending on which blend you get in, in the mix that uh, did not shatter. Yeah. So I guess to tie all this together, if you see your farmer or, you know, some people have properties that have a leased farmer, some people have permission farmers, it's a great idea to scope out what that farmer is doing. And if he's really planting a month ahead of time, knowing what he's doing, knowing what residual herbicide he's putting down, knowing whether he's going to chisel plow, you know, because if he has corn and as soon as he gets done harvesting, if he's going to go in and chisel plow, the last thing you want to do is put seed in the ground while the corn's still standing. So that's now's right. the time to ask questions to that farmer that's on your piece or the neighbors, if if that's an option to know what they're doing so that you can put your plan together. But yeah, this is a great opportunity if you have if you have farmers that are planting right now to possibly have a little bit different strategy for fall uh, food plot a little bit later, depending on their tillage and depending on their herbicide program. Now, that's exactly right, Terry. You know, another thing I'll throw out a word of caution is I see it, you know, with the questions we get at real world all the time and the sales coming through the food plotter in the spring typically is late to the game. He's he's planting later than he should. He, he's moving that planting into the early summer instead of in the spring. And in the fall, the food plotter wants to do the opposite. For some reason, the, the fall food plotter, he wants to plant too early and his plants get too mature. And the, the word of caution here is that we, we've got an early spring. The farmers are going heavy. As food plotters, we need to be prepared to go early as well. Now, that doesn't mean we need to go right now, but you know, ideally about two weeks after the farmer has planted his soybeans is when we want to plant ours. And uh, that two weeks is going to come a lot earlier this year than it has in the past few years. So a food plotter should be ready to go. Don't wait until, you know, whatever you traditionally do. I, I know a lot of people will plant their food plots on Memorial weekend there at the end of May. Um, I'm not saying that that's not going to work, but I think with the weather pattern setting up the way it is, you could be running into some drier conditions earlier this year than what we've seen in past years. So when the conditions get right, you know, um, Dwayne Hopkins says, uh, plant by the, by the weather, not by the calendar. And this is a perfect example. We've got the weather right now. The forecast looks good. We don't, I don't see any fear of a frost getting anything that we're planting right now in the 10 day forecast. So that 10 day forecast is pushing us out towards the end of April. Um, I would uh, not hesitate to, to plant here and I, I'm looking to plant my corn probably in the next week or so with all the farmers getting theirs out uh, right now. Um, they're going to wrap up pretty quick based on what I'm seeing with the forecast. So, you know, I'm going to, in the next week, two weeks max, I'm going to have my corn planted here and then move, yep. be moving on to soybeans. Yeah, my my goal this week, because all of the lime and fertilizer has been applied, I got the ground ready. My goal is, is as soon as I get back from Japan uh, to be putting corn in. And depending on when your our buddies Joe Johnson and Al Foster smack some turkeys on my property here the end of April, I'll be planting soybeans around when they're going to be on the farm chasing birds around. So, hey, I, I, you mentioned turkeys. I got some news for you. What's that? I got turkeys on my farm now. Did you finally have one show up, huh? No, I had a flock of them show up. I've got uh, no kidding, and they've been here. I, I've seen them almost every day for the last week. And and Robin's been hearing uh, the hearing them gobble in the morning when she takes the dogs out right about daybreak. Uh, she's been hearing them gobble pretty regular. But uh, we've got at least three hens and and a gobbler on the farm, and and I'm pretty sure those hens have nests on the farm. And where they showed up from, I have no idea. 
Uh, it's hard to tell, but I, I assure, assure you they are the spawn of Satan. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of excited to have them. We got bobcats now. You know, I was thinking yesterday, I seen the turkeys again, uh, two of them anyway. And uh, I was thinking, man, my grandpa would be just absolutely amazed. You know, this was his place. He passed away uh, a little over 30 years ago. And we got bobcats here today we, that he never seen. We got turkeys here today that he, he never seen a turkey on his place. Um, white-tailed deer. I mean, I've killed a couple of 200 inchers um, on his farm. That was unheard of. I, I don't know that he ever seen a deer on his farm. If he did, it was, you could count on one hand the times he's seen a deer on this farm. And if he could look down today and see what's here, he'd be absolutely amazed. Well, I think the key in all of this is if we're being a good steward of the property and creating good habitat, you're going to appeal to all wildlife, even though the focus of what we're doing is for whitetail, the the habitat or the ecosystem that we're preparing is going to benefit. And I know I complain a lot about turkeys, but, you know, everything in moderation is good. You get something completely out of whack and you, you just got a problem. And, right. you know, at least for me, with, with if I only had three turkeys, I would love it. But when you're talking 80 and 90, that I have more crop damage from turkey than I do from deer. But I know I I, uh, I get on rants about turkeys every once in a while, but they're pretty cool animals. And, and I, I'll be honest with you, if you're chasing turkeys in a normal situation, it's pretty cool when they gobble and they come in and they're all puffed up. It's an adrenaline rush. And I know a lot of people like turkey hunting because it's so much running and gunning. You know, it's not just sitting there for eight hours. But when you hunt turkeys on my farm, it's more like trying not to get stampeded by them because they'll, there's just, it's like, it's like sitting in a cattle pasture with a bunch of cattle. Actually, yeah, it's I've not been... a cattle pasture. It's more like a feedlot. Huh. Well, I've been thinking if these three hens here all have a brood and, and that brood just averages like eight, eight chicks a piece or poults, whatever you want to call them, you know, we're talking, I could have 25 turkeys here this fall. Yeah. Your, your, uh, predators will take care of some of them and, um, you won't, you won't have, it's hard to get that many one year, but yeah, I mean, but you're creating more habitat that's, that's going to appeal to them. So the rabbits, the quail, the, I mean, you got mm -hmm. pheasants on your place and there's not any pheasants around you anywhere. Nope. So yeah, it's pretty cool though, to see it all evolve. All right, well, let's take a quick break and uh, play a spot from our friends at Osseo. Talked to Joe miles the other day and uh, he had Bobby Worthington with him for the last couple of days. So he was all yeah, he fired did. up about that. So awesome. Um, Glad those two got to spend some time with you. But we'll be right back after this message from Osseo Gear. Osseo Gear introduces a premium line of bow hunting gear that is unmatched. Pairing nature's finest camouflage with the best technological innovations, Osseo Gear brings whitetail bow hunters the gear they need to be the best at their craft. The unique camouflage mimics the intricate feather pattern of North America's greatest predatorial creatures. Designed for invisibility, built for comfort, and engineered for function. Visit osseogear.com. That's A-S-I-O-Gear.com to start shopping. Osseo Gear, prepare to be invisible. All right, well, welcome back. Thanks for the folks at Osseo for helping us out on the podcast. Uh, make sure you check those guys out at Osseo Gear. Follow them on social media. And also they have a podcast called Mission Whitetail that you're not going to want to miss uh, Joe Miles is an absolute whitetail killer. Um, we got a couple announcements from Real World. We want to take a quick minute to uh, to make sure everybody's aware because it happens every year. We get to a certain point and people say, I didn't know. So let's go ahead and get that out of the way before we move on to our questions, Don. Yeah, the first one is uh, the, uh, the Miscantha shipping season is going to end May 1st. Um, you know, we ship every Monday, uh, May 1st is a Monday. That's the last ship date. If you want Miscanthus, I talked to Janice this week. She intends to have that reefer cooler that we rent to uh, store that Miscanthus. She said she intends to see that thing out of her sight on May 2nd. <laughs> the the Miscanthus orders have been piling in and Janice has had a gut full. She says the, the cooler is going on May 2nd. So 
folks, if you want Miscanthus, you better get your order in now because there's, it's not going to be very much past May 1st and the last of it's going to be gone. Yeah, and some of our dealers are carrying the product. They're buying bulk bags and separating it. So make sure you contact your local dealer. Some carry them, uh, Miscanthus, some do not. So uh, make sure you put a call in to your local dealer and find out what they're doing. But I, I want to take a minute and thank the staff in the office because people do not realize how much work uh, the Miscanthus is to manage and Janice and Eric and, and even everybody at the real world team, they just do a fantastic job managing this and we got a good crew, but, um, it's probably the toughest product that we have, uh, because of the logistics, because of the packaging and also because of the extra steps to keep it dormant in coolers before we ship it out because it's basically like a tree seedling it's a it's a living root that we have to get to people as soon as possible and get them to plant it right uh you know that we bring it in 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 bulk and uh it's packaged in the 100 count bags locally by an amish family who does a fantastic job for us um but it's got to be kept in refrigerated storage um from the time we get it uh, until it's shipped out to the customer now, when you take it out of storage, you got, you know, a couple of weeks or so before you can plant it. We get a lot of questions about that. So um, if you get it and uh, you're not able to plant within a week or so, I'd strongly suggest you try to find some refrigerated storage. If you do have refrigerated storage, don't make sure it does not go below freezing. Keep it at about the 35 degree mark. And if you do that, you can keep it easily for a couple of months until conditions are right for you to plant it. But, uh, you know, a lot of extra effort has to go into this Miscanthus to keep it alive and viable for the customer that we don't have to deal with with our other products. And uh, you're right, Janice and and Eric and Carrie go out of their way to uh, make sure that uh, it gets out in good condition and that the customer service is top notch uh, um, for anyone who calls the office. I won't confirm or deny that our church's walk-in cooler in the multi-purpose building has 1,500 rhizomes in it waiting for me to, <laughs> to get them in the ground. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know so, there's a lot of deer coolers, guys that have coolers for hanging their deer that also serve as miscanthus coolers in the spring. <laughs> I had to uh, I had to box mine up and and have them in storage. Patrick and I are putting in some miscanthus here this year, but we're not ready. We have to get some things uh, done with the property. So, luckily, our church had open storage, so we put them in boxes and taped them up real tight and said, "Do not open." So have them in well, there. I, I don't think there's any fear if someone opened them up and start eating them. I think <laughs> if, you ought to they be won't good. eat that. They won't eat many of them if they do. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is I think your Whitetail Master Academy, you're pretty close to the date on naming your buck, aren't you? Yeah, that's also May 1st. So we got the contest that, uh, you know, the members have an opportunity to uh, win a weekend here with me next March at my home farm. Um, we're just going to do whitetail things. I'll leave it at that. It's hard to tell them what we're going to do that weekend, but there'll be three winners. And the first one is whoever submits the name for the buck that I choose. Um, that's the deadline it will be May 1st. And that's when I'll, I'll pick the winner. Um, you do that by just going on to the homepage of the Whitetail Master Academy. And there'll be a place there for you to enter the name. Uh, the other two contests will end later this summer. One of those will be to guess the score. If I shoot that buck this fall, guess the score. And then, uh, uh, the date that I kill the buck, yes, the date and time and whoever comes closest on that will be a winner as well. So three opportunities for you guys to win and spend a weekend with me next March. Yep. And if Terry's Good. free, we'll get him there as well. Yeah. Um, there is, I don't have any details of it, but I did, um, we have some uh, very loyal podcast listeners down around between Bowling Green, Russellville, and Guthrie, Kentucky. We've done events down there um, in the past. Um, I think I did, I probably did five consulting visits down in that area this year, but I got to know some people um, down there and call them and think of them as, as, as close friends. 
but I was talking to one of them yesterday and I didn't have time to get all the details before this week's recording, but next week I'll have more details. But they are doing a ministry and fundraiser for the people in Haiti down there. They do a lot of mission work and um, I've agreed to donate a free consulting visit with some conditions on it. I'm not going to travel too awful far. But listen up next week and I'll give you information. They're going to raffle that thing off and raise money for ministries and mission trips down in uh, Haiti. And Haiti's kind of special to my family. Uh, What was it? Probably six years ago, we even did a Hunter's Helping Haiti event. Had you and, and Dwayne came down and raised a bunch of money. And I think we raised enough to build like four or five houses but the 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 cool thing about that is every dollar was raised to employ Haitians to build the house. So instead of just paying for a house to be built, we we were employing, um, you know, putting money into the local economy for people to work. So uh, this this ministry is is pretty big. They have this event every year, and uh, I'm going to be donating a free land consulting visit for that ministry for next year. So I'll have more information on that. Um, we have been working a little bit on our uh, Lester's Feet event, and I think, Don, I think the thing to do is if we if we do it too early, I don't think we can publicize and plan it quite as well. If we do it during hunting season, I think that we won't have as many attend. So I think we're probably going to do like an end of the year party after hunting season is over, uh, maybe after Christmas and New Year's. Um, I need to talk with some people about combining it at a trade show location as a possibility. Since everybody's there, there'll be other stuff to do. Or we do it local down here where we uh, have a package where you come to the event and maybe go to the ARC exhibit because that's actually in my hometown. So you can come to a Lester's Feet event and then go tour the Noah's Ark exhibit. So more information to come. Uh, We're working on that as we go. So are you ready to go to the first question or do you got anything else we need to go over? Um, I think I'm ready. I can't All think right, of we'll anything put, else. Let's put the first one up here and get going. Okay. The first one comes from Jerry Miller from Levington, Illinois. He says, hi, Don and Terry. Thanks for all the valuable information you guys share. My question is on mature bucks using bridges. My food plot and bedding is separated by a small river that freezes over every fall. I can't move my food on the other side. What have you guys experienced with deer using bridges? What is the best kind of bridge to use? Well, Jerry, I, they absolutely will use bridges. I've got a bridge here on my farm that they use regularly. It's a concrete bridge. And, uh, you know, when it's muddy out, you can just see muddy deer tracks back and forth across that bridge. And that'll really concentrate the deer movement. Um, the big thing I think you want to stay away from is like a wooden bridge where there's cracks between the boards. Uh, they don't, they don't want to cross that whatsoever. Um, I'm not saying they never will, but they, they don't like it near as well as something solid. Um, I have no idea, you know, the size of you're calling it a small river. So I'm not sure what options you have. If it's a Creek, you might put a, a you know, a big old culvert or whatever in and then just put, uh, you know, concrete scraps and riprap and whatever, and then dirt over that to create a, a, almost a land bridge. Um, that would work fantastic. I I guarantee you the deer would use it. Um, but yeah, deer absolutely will use bridges and I'm a big fan of, of putting them with, if you've got the opportunity, another thing you can do to create a Creek crossing. I show this at my master class is you can take a skid loader or mini hoe or whatever. And if the, the banks of that creek are fairly steep you can dig a crossing you know uh, pull back the, the banks on each side so you could actually drive an atv across it if you wanted Makes almost it, like uh, a you know, almost like a boat dock envision a boat dock on each side there you go and uh, they will absolutely use that as well and um, in fact i'm getting ready to put another one on my place this spring I'm going to have to rent a mini hoe to do it and probably get my son-in-law to operate it because he's a lot better at operating that thing than I am. And uh, we'll put a, a creek crossing in here at a new location. So uh, absolutely it will work, Jerry. All right. Good question. Uh, we'll go on to question number two. Okay. This one comes from Jesse Vandenberg from Polk City, Iowa. 
says, hey, Don and Terry, quick question for you, Don. With your goal this year to document and harvest the up-and-comer buck you have on your property with the potential to go 200 inches this year, would you pass on the shot if he presented you one that for some reason you weren't able to capture it on video? Thanks for all the content and keep up the good work. Good luck to you both this year. Um, Jesse, that's a hard question to answer because there's going to be a lot of factors that come into play, and one of the big ones is going to be timing. So in other words, if I don't get a crack at that buck until like the day before firearm season opens and he comes by, he's getting shot, and it doesn't matter if the camera's on him or not, I'm going to do my best to video document this kill like I had, I did Smokey and, uh, and Mel. And I should be able to get it done, but if something happens that I don't, um, there's just going to be some other factors come into play. So I can't really give you a concrete answer. I've had a lot of people ask me that question is why I selected this one. Um, it's just, we'll know when it happens, put it that way. Yeah. Um, you, you go to the woods every time you go, you have a video camera on you. Um, but there's just certain situations where things don't set up. It happens too quick. Obviously, uh, you know, as much as Steve can be with you, or I think Kyle actually filmed Smokey, you'll have a videographer with you, but you know, we do our best. And I think every time you go in the woods though, you have a video camera and that's the goal. I've carried a video camera on every single hunt that I've ever been on since 2004 when I shot my first 214 and I was accused of wrongdoing. And uh, I just, I film everything today. If if I shoot a deer, even if I don't get the kill on video, I, I film the recovery. I do an interview right after from the tree, right after I shoot one. Um, you know, I'll have the time and, and the date stamped on that video footage. And I'm covering my, my, tra my tracks now because uh, I, you only got to get accused of wrongdoing once and, and you, you become a little gun shy and you start to, uh, uh, you know, covering your butts, so to speak. And if someone wants to accuse me of something illegal, they better have their ducks in a row because I'm going to have the video footage. All right. Well, with all the new listeners that we have, uh, our analytics have spiked again for some reason. I wish I was smart enough to understand, um, it seems like we it goes through these phases where it's about the same amount of listeners. Then all of a sudden we have another spike, um, but we appreciate all of our followers. But with as many new listeners as what we have, Don, uh, explain a little bit about submitting a question, where you can do that, what you get back in return if we use it. And then again, for our folks listening on MTech that might not have internet, how they can also participate in this and submit a question. Yeah, so uh, if you go to chasinggiants.com, uh, there'll be a form there to fill out. Um, that's where you submit your questions. Please do not just email in questions. It's, it's, it's way harder for me to keep track of things. If you use that form, I've got a way to, to keep track of the ones that we've used and not used, and uh, that's how you want to do it. Um, if we use your question, you get a free T-shirt, so make sure that you put in your complete address. Uh, so that we can ship you that shirt. Your address is not going to ever appear on the podcast or anything like that, but we need the address to know where to ship you your shirt. Um, it'll be a Chasing Giants t-shirt um, with all our sponsors logos on the back of it. Um, if you are listening uh, on a, one of the phone lines, I know mtech has got one. But there's another one. I'm not even sure who that one's through. Um, you can mail in a question and, uh, to mail in a question, you would just mail that to the Real World Wildlife Products office. So that address is P.O. Box 55 in Arthur, Illinois, and the zip code is 61911. And just address it to Real World Wildlife Products. And when they see what it is, when they open your envelope, uh, they'll set it aside and they'll give it to me next time I'm in the office. Janice hands them to me all the time, so uh, they're used to getting these. Uh, those are the two ways to submit questions. And if you send one in, you know, through a letter, make sure you also put on there your T-shirt size. If we don't know uh, your T-shirt size, you're probably not going to get one. So make sure you put your T-shirt size there on your submission. 
And one other tip for you is, uh, and this next question is a is a little bit uh, an example of it. Uh, try to be as short and concise in your uh, in your questions as possible. This next question, we wanted to go ahead and use it, but it's actually so long that we had to take up two slides. So we're going to answer this one in two parts. So we'll start with the first one. Yeah, I'll, I'll build on what Terry just said. If you want your question read on the air, I'll tell you how not to have it read on the air. First of all, make it too long. This is the first time that we've ever had one <laughs> that we used two slides. Um, but it was, it was, I think there's two questions here and I wanted to answer both of them. So I went ahead and used it. The, the other way is if, if your question just pertains to your property, I, we get a lot of these. It'll, the guy will say, I've got 40 acres. I've got a five acre food plot on the south side. I, I access from the north. What should I plant in my food plot? You know, that's not a question that's going to help anybody out there except one person. That's the guy. We're trying to look at questions that when we answer them, the vast majority of our listeners can take something away from it. Property specific questions just about always get glanced over and passed over and not used. So, you know, we're, we're not criticizing anyone. We're just trying to help you submit questions that are usable and that, you know, and not be wasting your time. Right. End of rant. So that wasn't a, this one, that wasn't a rant. Nah, that was just kind of trying to provide some helpful information so people can submit questions that we use and uh, make them happy when they get their T-shirt. But this one comes from John Heistan. Hope I said your name right, John, from Columbus, Kansas. He says, guys, I'm extremely grateful for the podcast. It has renewed my faith and helped me review where I'm at and my priorities in life. For that, I am extremely thankful. My questions. When looking at old, ancient tree stands, you can imagine that at some point there was a thought process that dictated that location to be the most opportune spot for a harvest. Knowing that the environment around the tree stand has, has developed in 20, 30, 40 years, would you use it as a known concentration area in a management plan for deer activity or value it as a good time long gone, a good time long gone, and that the deer have adapted to the environment as well, even though land boundaries and crop versus timber stand has not expanded. Um, you want me to answer that one first? Yep. Okay. John, when I see old tree stands in the woods, and I see it a lot, I, I cover a lot of acres through consulting and this and that. Um, you know, I've, I've been in the woods with a lot of people over the years and a lot of them see a tree stand and they'll think like, apparently you're thinking here is this must be a good spot because there's a tree stand here. And what's this guy see? And, you know, I, I need to put a stand here in the same tree or close by because obviously it's a good spot. Well, I kind of take a little bit different approach. I assume through my experiences that most tree stands are not in a good spot. Um, you know, for a tree stand to be in a good spot, first of all, it has to have good access. I see all kinds of tree stands and I've scratched my head wondering how in the world did this hunter access this stand without busting deer? Uh, the second thing is a tree stand has to have a wind direction that it can be hunted with low probability of, of deer sending you. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen a tree stand and I've wondered to myself, what wind direction is this guy hunting with? Because no matter which wind direction it is, there's a good likelihood that deer are going to be downwind. So um, when I see a, a old tree stand in the woods, I do pick it apart, but usually way over half of the time, the majority of the time I'm walking away thinking that guy should have picked a better spot. That was not a good spot for a stand. Um, so, so that's kind of my approach. When you see these old stands, ask yourself, does it have good access and what wind direction can it be hunted with? And if you can't come up with a positive answer for both those questions, it's not in a good spot. Now I say this, I've also seen some fantastic locations that have tree stands in them. And I'm talking tree stands of various ages, you know, some from probably way back in the 1970s or 80s and others that are, you know, more recent in the last season or so. Um, so 
there are definitely some stands out there that are in great locations, but you really need to assess each one you see and decide for yourself. Was that it? Was that stand put in a good location or could that deer hunter have done better? Most stands that are on farms that I visited this year are in locations that there's good buck signed, but that doesn't make it a good, a good hunting location. That's a great point, Terry. Most stands are hung based on sign and, uh, signs a starting point. I mean, sign is good, but if you don't have good access and you can't get in there with, with, and hunt a certain wind direction, it's worthless. Now saying that if you had a property that Al Foster or Bobby Worthington had hunted before, and there's an old tree stand there, I would put a stand right in the same tree. <laughs> if you know it's their stand, you start thinking that there's a way to get to it. There is a good access and there is a good wind direction. All right. Well, here's the second part of his question. I'm going to share now. Uh, secondly, my Late grandmother in, in the 80s worked at a place with roughly 20,000 acres secluded from any hunting pressure. She used to talk about how days on end she would be on the edge of being late to work because of deer entering and exiting milo fields. With the modification of corn and double cropping wheat and beans, we see less milo planted in our area. Beyond the real world wildlife products up on game land, is milo viewed as a lesser preferred crop for deer compared to modern corn and beans? Or is it the fat oil protein comparison because the focus is away from milo sorghum? With what is looking to be two years of drought in a row, would more drought resistant milo sorghum be a sure thing for some value, valuable nutrient sources for deer? Or should a person continue to chance it with corn or beans? Last year, my bean harvest was zero to seven bushels per acre. Thank you again for the podcast. Let's go, Brandon, and our wildlife commission on trail camera knowledge. That was an embarrassment. <laughs> well, I have, I have no idea what that was about. I guess it's the trail cameras on public land he's talking yeah, he's about. From, he's from Kansas. Okay. Um. In regards to milo or grain sorghum, I do not have a lot of experience with it, but I am going to plant at least one of my plots, uh, smaller plots in grain sorghum this year, possibly two, um, just depending on how a couple of things that work out for me here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, the the uh, advantage of grain sorghum is that, it, as mentioned, it's more drought tolerant than corn or soybeans. And it's got a shorter growing season than corn, so it can be planted later. I know a local farmer here who used to double crop grain sorghum or milo, whichever you want to call it, with his wheat. So he would harvest his wheat about uh, the 1st of July, and immediately he would plant grain sorghum, and he would get a crop by double cropping it. So, uh, you know, I, I with... Soybeans taking so much pressure, as well as the nutricrave corn plots getting harvested or getting hammered by the, the deer and other wildlife. I, I'm looking at other grain sources. This year, I ran out of grain on my farm, and I don't ever want to do that again. Uh, luckily, we had a lot of winter wheat in our area to kind of take some of that pressure. But I'm going to plant some some grain sorghum this year and see what happens with it. And uh, you know, it might lead to, if, if the deer really like it, like I hope they do, and I've heard they do, we may start, uh, you know, testing some different varieties of grain sorghum to see what we can come up with. I do not know if how the protein content and the fat content of grain sorghum compares to soybeans and corn at this time, but it's definitely something that we're looking at. Um, just rest assured that if we do bring something to market, it's going to be different than your average grain sorghum or, or milo, but it'll, it'll be probably, years down the road. It won't it'll be probably next take us year. at least three to four years to get it. But right. the, the other thing that I like about it, and you probably see it and laugh at it in some of my plans is I love height variations in food plots and creating edges. And uh, if you strategically, I think that has some potential now getting to the right variety, um, it's going to take a little bit of work, so we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I'll throw this out there to the listeners. I'm, I'm sure there's people listening that have a way more experience with grain sorghum than I do. Um, if you've got some feedback that you'd like to share with me, 
um, please do that privately so we don't have the whole world in our competition uh, reading your comments. Um, you know, send me your feedback. You know, if you know of a, spe a special variety, for example, of, of grain sorghum that the deer seem to prefer or, or you know, any uh, tips on, you know, planting, growing, whatever, fertilizer requirements, um, I'm all ears. I mean, I'm still learning just like everybody else. So, uh, you know, throw out that knowledge and, and share it with me, and I'd, I'd be grateful for that. <laughs> What's the over under that says that it'll be there'll be two different people releasing grain sorghum as products here before the end of the summer? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm hoping that um, I don't even know. If Never mind. Go there. <laughs> yeah, move on to the next question for that one, Don. <laughs> uh, next one comes from David Armstrong from Newman, Georgia. Um, he says, Don, I recently heard you say on a podcast that you felt 80% confident you could harvest the buck you are following this off season. Do you ever feel like harvesting target bucks, even with a vertical bow is too easy? I feel like if I have a target buck betting on my farm, then he will be easy to kill. And in fact, almost too easy. Everyone today seems to be trying to make harvesting bucks easier, but I feel like it should be harder and not easier. I know people will say switch to a recurve, and that is a valid argument, but I think it, it would result in wounding a lot of bucks making that change at my age, 54. What are your personal thoughts on most mature bucks being easy to kill? Uh, well, David, I understand exactly where you're coming from, exactly. Um, to be honest, a mature buck on my home farm is not all that difficult to kill. Now that doesn't mean I can go out in a week and get him killed, but in the course of an entire hunting season, if he's spending much time at all on my farm, I can get him killed. Um, saying that I also hunt a lot of properties that are not my own properties where I simply have permission, uh, public land, even, um, properties where I'm not allowed to plant a food plot. I'm not allowed to do any habitat work. And I can tell you, and a couple of bucks that I've killed off of those places are the Joey Buck and, and Trump. Both of those came with places from places like that. I can tell you that the satisfaction I get from killing those bucks on tougher properties is more rewarding than a buck I kill here on my home farm. Now, you talk about making it more difficult. I think you raise the bar um, to make it as difficult as, as possible on your home or on a property like I have, or like what you have and you describe, um, instead of shooting four-year-olds, shoot six-year-olds. See how much harder it is to shoot a six-year-old than a four-year-old. Uh, there's not many guys out there with any weapon that are holding out for five, six-year-old bucks. There's a lot of them that claim they are, and then a good four-year-old comes by and he gets shot. And, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm a guy that shot Mel at four years old. And I, I went over the reasons for that many times, but, uh, you know, people talk about, well, it's easy because he's got a farm and he feeds them and blah, blah, blah. He does this. And well, you, you still got to let them get to maturity and the willpower to let them get to maturity. Most deer hunters lack. They just will never have what it takes to let a good four-year-old go and become a six-year-old. And the buck I'm chasing this year that you mentioned is exactly that. I'm, I'm going to venture to say 99% of deer hunters would have shot that buck two years ago when he was four years old. He is rack scored. I've got the sheds. He scored 168 inches that year. I'm guessing 99% of deer hunters would have shot that buck as a 168 inch four year old. And now when I let him go for two more years and let him get to six, those same people, some of those people will be the same ones that say, yeah, it's easy for him because blah, blah, blah. He's got this private property. He's got it set up. He's got whatever. He, he turns loose pin deer. He's got a high fence all the way around his farm. He feeds them, blah, blah, blah. Well, the fact is that those people, the haters, they don't have the willpower to do what it takes. No matter what resources they have, time, money, property, unlimited, they still would not shoot those kind of deer because what they lack is the willpower to let a four-year-old walk. And, uh, you know, when it comes to being too easy, absolutely, it can be too easy. Um, we got to keep the challenge in it. 
And, and like you mentioned, most deer hunters and the hunting industry, the hunting industry is, is to blame for this. Uh, that's my beef with the ATA Association. Everything they do is to make things easier. Um, they are the ones that pushed, their lobbyists pushed for crossbows in our archery seasons. And I, I want to set the record straight on my opinion about crossbows. I am not against crossbows whatsoever, uh, for, especially for a handicapped person. Uh, if we can keep those people in the woods, fine. My opposition to crossbows is my opposition is for a healthy middle-aged full-grown man to be shooting a crossbow in archery season if you're such a crossbow fan take your crossbow out during the gun season most gun seasons will now allow you to use archery gear during the gun season you might have to wear orange but you can still do it if you're such a fan of crossbows take it out during gun season because i'm going to tell you 99.99 percent of guys with a crossbow in their hand when when gun season comes around that crossbow gets thrown in the corner and they're going to use the, the most powerful weapon, the longest range weapon they possibly can. It's not because they care. They're a fan of crossbows. They're a fan of doing it easy. There's my rant for the podcast, Terry. I think to circle back on the original question, um, <laughs> making it easy, it's I think you have when when the light switch flips and you finally figure out what mature bucks do and how you have to hunt them to kill them consistently, which is wind access, lack of intrusion to consistently do it. When that clicks, I do think the hardest part of the, of the process is letting them get to the older age structure. The, the actual harvesting of the animal is probably the easiest of the steps because you have it figured out, but keeping a deer, I mean, so many deer get shot by the neighbors. We all have it happen. You have it happen. I have it happen. And then keeping that deer on your farm with habitat work, uh, that's the hardest part of the whole equation. And I, and I can see where David is talking. When you get to the point that you have it and you have it figured out, the, the actual, you even touched on that in the Mel video. It's kind of like it's almost a sad point when it's when it's over, the chase is over. So I get what he's saying, but you know, the difficulty is like you said, it's the discipline and it's all the other variables with wild deer to let them get to that age. Yep. Very well said, Terry. Very well said. All right. We'll finish up. I think we got maybe one or two more here. Okay. This one comes from Russell Hilliard from Sisney, Illinois. He says, Hey, Don and Terry, I'm a big fan of the podcast and recently listened to episode 158. I normally really enjoy the rants, but this <laughs> one kind of came off wrong. I agree. Big buck contests are bad, but do you guys really think coyote and coon roundups are bad. They are designed to help Turkey populations when the government won't help. I know Terry hates them, but they are starting to struggle in my area. Thanks. Well, Russell, I think that, uh, anytime you're putting money or prizes <coughs> on the killing of wildlife, I, I don't think that's a, a good thing, but you know, it's, I, I get your point. Is it really any different than us back in the day? Like when I was in high school, um, trapping coons and coyotes, um, and selling the pelts. I, I mean, I, I, you know, that kind of brought out some of the worst in people too. And when you could get $40 and I'm talking, what would that have been 40 years ago, 40 years ago, when you could get $40 for a coon, think about $40, 40 years ago, that'd be like a hundred dollar bill today. When you could get that much, it brought out the worst in people. I remember going to school with guys, um, in my class who would at night, they would drive around country roads with spotlights and rifles looking for coons, um, to shoot because they take the coon to the fur buyer and they'd get money. And I guess to your point, these coyote and coon contests do help turkey populations, pheasant populations, um, and, and such. I just, uh, I don't know. I, I just have a hard time with it uh, myself. Um, I, I'm not, my opinion is not, not so strong that I'm going to go on a crazy rant here about it. Um, I, I just, the whole contest thing 
It's like anything else. There's a few bad eggs that ruin it for everybody. And whenever you put a person involved in anything, people cheat, people, you know, it, it's just, I don't know. I, I feel that if we're going to be doing something for the benefit of the wildlife, we need to do it for the benefit of the wildlife, not because of prize money or contests. I mean, but I, I don't have a problem. If somebody wants to do this, I'm not going to judge you or criticize you or anything else. It's just, um, and, and 98% of the people that participate in these are good people that are just looking for, you know, to stroke their little competitive juices a little bit. I don't need that. So it's not important to me, but, but, you know, the other yeah. thing that really, the other thing that really is a shame in this is especially with these coon roundups is we, we talked about this early days in the podcast where, you know, people would drop these guys off with coon dogs and they don't care what property they run across. And and if a local if a local contest is encouraging, empowering, or even tolerating trespassing and putting intrusion on my farm that I pay the taxes on, that I do all the work on, that I spend thousands and thousands of dollars in in and and not to mention the time, and you ruin it for what my goals are on that property, I have a big problem with it. So yeah, that that's where I really got really bent out of shape and and probably you know got a little too firm on the contest stuff is because people just don't care they but again ninety eight percent of the people that participate in these things are probably just good guys and can't play golf that day or can't go fishing and it's another way to get out with the boys and run around so uh, it, it's fine if you do it it's just I I don't think we should benefit or put monetary prizes when it comes to habitat we should do it for the right reasons yeah i know guys that take part in these coyote contests and they're and some of them especially are very ethical hunters i know they're doing nothing wrong and i'm talking guys that place high and win these contests that, that know what they're doing they're very good outdoorsmen but then you know you got the guys like recently well it, it's been probably a couple months ago there was the guys doing the walleye fishing circuit remember and they were shoving lead weights down these fish's throats to make the fish way more at weigh in and they got caught at it because they was one in contest after contest and guys were looking at that fish thinking how does this fish weigh what it what the, what the scale shows mm -hmm. and uh, finally somebody uh, at one of the weigh-ins cut the fish open and boom there, these lead sinkers were falling out i mean big lead sinkers and uh that's the kind of thing that when you put money on a animal's head no matter how it's done through a contest or whatever it brings out the worst in some people money is the root of all evil and uh when you put a, put money there it, it just brings out the worst in people yeah again a few people ruin it for everybody and yeah yep all right don well I hate to cut it short, but I got a pack, buddy. I got a, actually there's a, there's a podcast listener and a consulting client of yours that's going to be going with Japan with me this week and, uh, chasing him around. So maybe I'll put a chasing giants hat on him as we're running around downtown Nagoya. Well, I want to see chasing giants memorabilia all over Japan <laughs> in your social media post. I'll see if I yeah. can come back with a, uh, with a, a sushi or raw fish sponsorship for you and you get to eat it on camera. Well, that's probably not going to work for me. <laughs> not going to work for me. I'm redneck country boy as much as you could possibly be. Uh, right now I'm hoping that somebody gets me some morel mushrooms. I haven't had morel mushrooms. That's one thing I don't have on my farm. And, uh, I might have to try to get out this week. See if I could find a few. Yeah, I've never had one. Oh, fantastic! You, you'll you'll quit hunting anything to to find them. All right. Well, uh, before we sign off here, real quick, uh, this is Friday night. Like I said, I'm getting ready to get on a plane. Uh, there is a family that we're really close to here in northern Kentucky that has a 16, 17 year old son battling cancer right now, and Actually, I was pretty proud. The crosstown softball game between the county school and the city school is tonight, and all of the players decided to make the game about raising money for the family. 
So uh, it's going to be Friday night. So by the time people hear this, it'll already be over. But uh, please, please keep a, a young man by the name of Cameron in your prayers. Um, he's uh, he's fighting and getting his treatments right now. The family's uh, trying to do what they can to make sure they're there with him. Lester's feet's helping them, but also the community. And I love the fact that our listeners and our communities kind of rally around situations like this because we hear it all the time. That's how the foundation started. Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of people coming together that enjoy the same type of thing, but know what the priority should be at all times. And that's and that's helping others in their community and taking care of people. And uh, yep. I'm really proud of the young people in my hometown for wanting to turn just a softball game into a fundraiser to help this family. It was all the kids idea. So pretty yep. cool. I'd like to ask for prayer for a local family as well. Um, a young couple that uh, I know fairly well. I know the parents of the, the young lady really well. Um, Jake and Haley, they had a baby boy premature here a week or two ago. Um, he weighed three pounds something. He was definitely under four pounds. His name is Hank, and uh, he could use some prayers. He's in. He's still in the hospital and will be until he reaches a certain weight. And, um, yep. Uh, there's some other parameters he has to reach before he, he can be released. But uh, uh, the, the hospital he's staying in is a good probably hour and a half away from the family. So, uh, you know, Haley's up there with him, you know, every day, uh, kind of putting some stress on them and just ask for prayers for that family as well. Yeah, the, the Lester's Feet Board reviewed that family's uh, application yesterday and put a package together. So we uh, we have some um, some assistance that was donated by a lot of the listeners on this on this podcast is going to be helping them as they're off work and trying to take care of logistics of taking care of this baby. So we appreciate everybody's prayers, but also the donations that you made to the foundation are going directly to situations like this. Yeah, we appreciate all the support. Lester's feet has grown way bigger than I think either one of us ever dreamed it would. Um, we, we've got to be over a million dollars now and, and raised funds for, for families. Yeah. And 100% of that has went to families. There's not been a penny of it go to any other person or any, you know, any of us or administrative costs or anything like that. Even legal fees have been donated. Yep. So well, I think you even paid some out of your pocket, didn't you? Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's my that's, wife. That's my wife and I's donation to the foundation every year. Uh, guys, I'm telling you. If you're watching this on YouTube, take a good look at Terry Peer. You talk about a high character person. That's exactly why we're friends and why he's the co-host of this uh, podcast with me. Um, if you if you only knew how much he helped others, I, I think his entire life is is centered around helping others. I've just seen it so many times, and people never even hear about it or see it. So, well, but it, appreciate it's, you, it's, Terry. I appreciate that, but it's not just me. You know, the first. I don't want to drag the podcast on, but the first the first time we outran our headlights and decided we were going to do this, we didn't know what we were getting into. And one of our podcast listeners uh, from New York, I believe, New York or New Jersey, called me, and he's an attorney. He actually paid for the first legal fees to get us set up as a corporation in the state of Kentucky so we could start being in compliance with the IRS. And then as time goes on, you know, it's it's not just me. There's other people that privately call or contact us and say they they really appreciate the fact that every dollar that's donated goes to the families and they say how can we help with administrative or marketing or you know we still have it's big enough now we have to pay for a cpa to do our taxes and um so all of that money not just me but you know there's there's several others that step up and say they love the vision of the foundation to where it's not just a bunch of people skimming off the top uh, to avoid taxes and, and help let us run this organization the way that we are. And um, it's it's far beyond me and my family. And and those people don't even want to be uh, recognized. I've tried to do it and they don't. But just know that a lot of people are really thankful that it frees up all of this donated money to go to families. Yep. That's what we're about. Helping others through deer hunting, bringing the deer hunting community together, um, sharing our our Christian faith, and uh, just trying to be good stewards of what we've been given here on this earth. All right.
Well, we'll see you next week. I'll have more information on this uh, consulting visit that I'm donating, and I will talk to you when I get back from Japan, Don. Sounds good. Have a safe trip, Terry. God bless right. everyone. Have a great week. Take, take care. Chasing Giants has been brought to you by Osseo Camo, by a farm real estate company, 360 Hunting Blinds, Victory Chevrolet, Real World Wildlife Products, Matthews Archery, Novix Tree Stands, Gingerich Tree Farm, WildlifeFarming.com, Quiet Cat, and Vortex Optics. Thanks for listening and tune in next week for another episode of Chasing Giants.